for as long as you've been here, has it been pronounced Wobar? Yeah. Okay. It's funny, I heard you call it Wobar, and like I've never, yeah. it's not what I ever called it, or like what I heard anyone call it. Well, Wobar sounds like, it sounds like a sort of a cute, adorable character. Uh, we yeah. always call it WBAR. I still call it WBAR. Yeah. I'm, I, I wonder when that changed. Service. We're gonna fade this mix So that was obviously Incred, um, short for Incredible. That was the mix um, at Whore by Horse Girl. No relation. But up next, we're gonna play a long song staple from the group Les Rallies de Nudes. And this song is. Wait, what is this? Who is that? He looks so bad in that hair. Oh, Ethan Hawke? Watching yeah. a Disney Plus ad. Wait, let me just... What you all definitely want to hear this. Hi, I'm Lee. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a Barnard first year. Uh, right now, I am the head archivist, which just means that I coordinate all of our archiving projects that are happening at the moment. Uh, and our big one um, right now is trying to organize our record cd cassette 45 collection we have so much we have thousands of um physical music pieces and some of our cds are just missing oh we'll have to find the snoop dog cd i mean we have <laughs> tons up here um even like these which like people have written on i mean that looks pretty sick wait yeah. let's see no it does but it's probably not uh, super usable in terms of no definitely not this is the office to be in slightly better condition. It's kind of turned into a storage space. As um, When we started the reorganization project, we took down a bunch of the CDs were, that were on the walls in there, mm -hmm. and they're in boxes in here now. It will take time, but it will be worth it because yeah. creating a system that is not going to be lost to oblivion um, is will help future web archivists or even just people who want to access the music to be able to not have to sift through everything. The origin story that I learned um, mostly through Oddity, who was the previous a previous GM and promotions director. Um, because I always like heard her recite it at the at our general body meetings and stuff was that there were Barnard students working at WKCR and they wanted to incorporate either like incorporate punk into like some of the programming or start their own show with punk music and the programming directors at WKCR were like hell no it was a very strictly jazz and classical station um, I think and so they left WKCR and came to Barnard to start their own station. I would say that we're still kind of known as like more rock, punk, underground um, music, even though uh, we have shifted to more kind of some pop, some people like pop, even if it's like older pop, or we have some uh, international shows on as well at the moment. Um, but I would say our reputation, um, I mean, everybody knows about us, but I'm not sure that everybody kind of knows about, like, what we are and what we stand for, which is, like, you know, supporting smaller independent artists, um, and letting students kind of have their own voice. Actually, maybe that is what we're known for. September... 24th of 1991, there was an article, the headline cover story, uh, students form new radio station. So that's um, adorable. My name is Jen Small. I graduated from Barnard in 1993. Um, and what was my role at the radio station? Um, I was one of the co-founders along with Susan Leff and Heather Willingans. Um, Susan and I both had transferred to Barnard and at our previous schools, we both 
were involved in the radio station and it was sort of sad not to have a real color, not a real color, a less professional college radio station than WKCR. Um, I remember I tried to like sort of DJ there and it seemed like everybody had been DJing there for like 25 years. Um, and so it felt really different um, than what I was used to. So we came up with this harebrained scheme to start a radio station. I spent college, you know, working in record stores and interning at record labels and at MTV and still always wanted to do a radio show and never knew I was never really gonna have a chance. And then I found out that there were some women at Barnard who were starting a radio station. Um, and I knew I really wanted to be involved. We got on the air in 1993. Um, and I graduated very, very soon after. We knew that it would be a place for the nerds and the outcasts and the goths and the punks and the weirdos um and um you know those are my people once the ball started rolling there was a lot of interest and you know among the first generation of wbar folks there were uh, Adam Short was one of them. He was a good friend of mine. Beth Erdang was another one. She was another good friend of mine. So it really started off kind of with friends and that sort of expanded to anybody who was interested. Vaguely, I just remember seeing like a flyer or something up around, probably it was like Macintosh or something, um, just saying that there was going to be a, a station and if you were interested in being a DJ you know, come talk to us. So um, I was very, very interested, very keen. Um, I what considered myself as sort of an amateur DJ. I hadn't gone to a college with free with free form stations, so I didn't really know what that was. I wasn't like a cool kid who who knew like punk or indie stuff so much. Like I, I really always loved music. I played music. I would have considered myself sort of a voracious listener, but not a particularly cool stuff. Like I just really liked music. WBAR was being broadcasted over the Rome phone lines, I, I, I guess I, I'm not really 100% sure, or I don't remember how the technology worked, but the, but the radio station was only available in the dorms where there were the Rome phones. So if you were on the street, if you were on campus, if you were standing in the middle of 116th Street, you would not be able to hear. <laughs> Well, I think the way he put it was that we were just sort of like the DJs for the cafeteria. You know, it was, it was that um, much on a kind of shoestring in terms of the, the reach of, of the signal, I guess, you know, because it started out, they weren't going to start out blasting it through to downtown. I don't know if anybody was listening to us. I don't know if everybody was listening to us. I think we primarily listened to ourselves. You know, they'd like eat a muffin in Lower Mac and just listen. I was doing my radio show and I would often just say, you know, if anyone is out there, please call me. Um, let me know you're listening. I'll, I'll play anything you want to. And it would just be crickets. Nobody would pick up, no one would call. I would never get anyone uh, that would confirm they were listening. And then I thought, well, maybe people were just nervous and didn't want to talk to the DJ. So I started to say things like, if you're out there and listening, call me and then hang up really quickly. So you don't have to talk to me. You don't even have to make a request. I just want to know that someone else is out there listening and nobody was ever listening. I remember once there was like a rat or a mouse in the transmission room. And I was like on a chair talking into the microphone being like, I don't know if anyone's listening, but if anyone hears this, can somebody please come down to the bottom floor of Macintosh? There is a rat, you know, and somebody came, I was like, thank God, like at least one person was listening. They like sent someone down. Like when Wobar is down, people are like, Wobar is down. You know, like, like and, and you're like, oh, so you, you would listen, you know. For a long time, the rule that didn't really get like backed up super well, like there wasn't really like a perfectly um, coherent reason for this. Um, but like, it was like, you can't tell people how to find out how many people are listening. Like that was like against the rules. Like staff was not allowed to do that. It was supposed to be like in the dark. Um, and, and it was, no one knew. Like, like, like only staff knew and you were, and like for the most part it was like a pretty well guarded secret. And the idea was that they would like lose morale. I don't even, like I think if I knew that no one was listening, I don't think I would 
do a lower quality show. You know, it's kind of like, I think it would just be a perhaps a more vulnerable or naked show or like maybe less polished. I think that that is what made it feel experiment, experimental and, and kind of um, liberating because you're like, well, how many people are actually listening to this? I can kind of do whatever I want. Like no one is putting any restraints on me. Um, and that's when, that's when people go full throttle with creativity. We got, let's see what we got here. We got some cardigans, <laughs> some Mazzy Star. Oops, some, some Modest Mouse. <laughs> we got a lot going on here. What? Oh! This must be what they had on. Oh, the Bob's Burgers soundtrack. Yeah, no, I, we really do have everything here. Yeah, a lot of it is just like, if the boxes were open, there's just like kind of dust caking them, but we will fix that. I would just scour those um, record reviews for names of record labels. And, you know, this was really pre-Google, so uh, researching out how to find those record label addresses and writing, hand, writing them by hand to be able to get music sent in. It sounds very corny, but I just never knew that stuff was there. I thought the stuff you listened to was the stuff that was on the radio. Like I thought somebody was supposed to tell you what to listen to. I just didn't know. And one of my favorite pastimes was just to go into, you know, sort of old secondhand places and look through their vinyl. Like just, what is this, this bizarre album? I mean, this is the one thing that I kind of miss about that time. We have all these amazing um, Spotify and, you know, sort of algorithms that anticipate our needs and what we might like. But back then it was kind of, rogue like it was sort of wild west everything in general was so much more cur curated then the labels had a curatorial sensibility the station you know by show we had a curatorial sensibility and because editing was needed you can't you don't have access to everything no but there's no algorithm following you around all the time you know like we were the algorithm we were you know, if you like this, like tune in next week and I'll play you more stuff that this particular brain likes and maybe you'll like it too. I was very anti the like, like when Spotify started curating like vibe playlists, they're kind of like, there's like no, there's like no genre for this one. Like it's just like a summer day. It's kind of like, oh my God. <laughs> the applications kind of steadily got a little bit murkier over the years. There are still always like a really strong group of people that come in with these like really interesting and particular ideas. But more and more every year, there are like people who kind of just want to come on and vibe. <laughs> with, with the advent of that and like vibe based like music consumption, like people would like um, the 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 playlist that you submitted with your application became like pretty important. It was kind of like, all right, we want like, you know, diversity of music. Like we're not, we're not curating like a, a taste with Bobar. It's like we're trying to get like everything. I would take every DJ's playlist and try to mash it all together and make a weekly WBAR chart of what our, what, what songs we were playing so we could report that to the radio station. But at the time, you know, I, I can't remember exactly how many shows we had on the air, but Everybody played such wildly diverse music that, you know, there wasn't really any, you know, we, there was no real consensus or sound to the station. It wasn't like there were certain songs that all the DJs were playing. Everybody was playing completely um, personal, individualized, you know, um, DJ sets. So, um, so we wouldn't really have a proper chart to submit to CMJ, so I would just make one up. I always wanted to play music on the radio, says David Goldberg. I hope he. Um, I hope he was happy. Um, he likes shimmy disc. Why? Because doesn't everyone want to be a cult figure? No, but honestly, I feel it's my duty to provide some rock aesthetic to this university. <laughs> by the way, by new music, I mean lots of stuff. Loud, some something, lots, even Sesame Street songs. We got forty-eight cards. Twelve people with experience. Of course, you got everybody who wanted to show. <laughs> <laughs> Nevermind by Nirvana came out while I was a sophomore or a junior. Um, it, you know, there wasn't really, alternative music wasn't really a genre at the time. Um, there was college rock, 
it was like American indie music and it was REM and bands on SST and you know, Husker Du and the replacements and... I mean, Sonic Youth always played, you know, like everybody played Sonic Youth. Liz Fair came out the spring of my senior year and that was all that I listened to. It was like the B-side to this this song called Pac-Man Fever and it was called Ode to a Centipede, which was like an arcade video game back in the day. So I think it was like, I'd put something on like that and go, oh, let's discuss it. Is this kitsch or is it just trash? I was a DJ for a show called Far Too Canadian um, and it was only Canadian music and <laughs> talking about things that were Canadian. My actual show was called The Bust of Elvis and it was like everything that was played had to have a woman in the band, right? Which is kind of, it was, it was harder then. Like I remember playing like a Beastie Boys track and being like, a woman played the flute on this track. I was really, really into um, sort of house dance music and that kind of thing, which um, has incredible rich roots in New York. Sean and I told you about film, uh, rather her own show, The High Rise. And at that time, you know, she, she were really, really close friends at one point. And so one of the things that was surprising to me, she was really into this one track I remember by DJ Kaoki at that time called Funky Guitar. Now Kaoki was part of that whole club kid movement, you know, um, at, uh, at, at Limelight. And, you know, I just, you know, for me, I was sort of like, you know, coming out of like, you know, this, you know, this punk rock world, you know, where, you know, in, in the seventies and eighties, you know, there was a real sort of like, it, it had a real stigma attached to it. I probably have to say it was like, you know, her introducing that to me would be the first person whose opinions I respected, who really thought that there was something there, there. There are sort of factions. There are people who had just like very, very narrow lanes of music taste where it's like, they liked, you know, like 1970 to 1973, like glam disco, like something that was just like, I know nothing about this. And they were like hyper specific on it. Um, I was I, in the minority of like people who were playing any kind of hip hop my senior year. I found this t-shirt from our first benefit. I don't know if WBA or Robar still has benefits, but we had a benefit show that featured exactly zero female musicians. So like, <laughs> we clearly, while I had taken a lot of women's studies classes, we did not realize like, oh, we have a platform and we can promote whatever we want. We, it was very like white male. And in retrospect, I'm pretty embarrassed about that. Um, but it was like college radio in the 90s and it was like just the beginning of like Riot Girl. Everybody feels like they go to the best school in the country, right? That's the way they're made to feel. And I was like, at Barnard, you feel like you're at the second best school on the campus. Like you're really not at, <laughs> you don't, you don't get that feeling, which is what I think supports a lot of people. So I think that it gave, I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that that's how it felt. And I felt like the station gave us that sort of specificity that it was the only thing I could think of that people were crossing the street to us for. Here we go, okay. Uh, Article three, membership. Uh, all members of the Columbia University community can become involved with WBAR on all levels. However, the station's primary responsibility will be to the Barnard community. There was sort of like a shift that happened before I came to Wilbar, where basically, like, I think Wilbar had used to be um, dominated by, like, honestly, like, people not that far from, from me. Like, it, like, sort of, like, um, engineering, but, like, into, like, alternative music. Um, and, like, I know how to run this. It was sort of, like, broy and, like, um, uh, annoying. This guy, uh, who was like a very intimidating character who had like skinny black ripped jeans and like the spiked hot topic belt and like very obscure bands and this shirt that's like clinging to him for like dear life. And uh, I'm sure he had a very like, you know, aggressive haircut, bunch of piercings. And I'm like getting to campus freshman, just like completely out of my elements. Um, like I want to do my, you know, punk emo show. And he's like, you don't, you know, if you don't listen to these bands, you're not like really into this genre. And I'm just like deflated. Like clearly I felt like this guy's pulled rank on me. I still apply for a show, just like immediately get rejected. I'm sure like didn't bother the application. Um, and like on the way out, these two girls who happen to have this show, 
Uh, they're like, oh, we like overheard you doing this pitch for the show. Like, would you want us to join our show? And it was a really like an incredibly kind gesture for like a, a lost college freshman. There was a like kind of an ethos of like people trying to like out cool each other with like how obscure their music was, or maybe that's just how I perceived it. Um, as someone who was playing just like what I felt to be like just the stuff that I liked, which wasn't like super obscure older stuff. There sort of was like a a push towards like authenticity, representation, and like um yeah, and all, and and diversity, like like in the in sounds represented, like I think just in general, like mainly and just that like it's really easy to get a lot of like indie. It definitely impacted like how we were looking at our pool of applicants, not necessarily like kind of looking at who was applying and like why maybe certain people like weren't applying, why were like the majority of our applicants mostly white students um, and then kind of seeing how we could change the language of Wabar to encourage and like kind of like shift the like notion of Wabar and just like because I think there was like a worry that like a lot of people on campus just sort of dismissed Wabar as this like you know like weird space for like indie white kids who like have superiority complexes which was not i mean by the time i got there i'm oh, sorry by the time i got there was not the case really anymore this is our soundboard i think this is like our third in Wilbar's history maybe maybe fourth who knows um but it basically determines the uh, where the audio is coming from that is going out on air into the world. So um, currently I'm playing music through the auxiliary cord, which is plugged into my computer, but we also have a couple options for CDs. And then these are the two mics. So um, we also have turntables and tape one and tape two, which I honestly couldn't tell you what what goes into those? Um, For cassette. cassette. Oh, okay, vintage. Um, if you're like a real profesh, what you can do is at the end of a song, you can like fade the, uh, the auxiliary out. It's kind of how you do it in the, in the biz. <laughs> We're kind of known as one of those places on campus that if people need help, even if it's like something independent, like the guy who came last week and wanted to borrow our drum kit and we were like, we've never met before, take our drum kit. If you're not a Wobar DJ or a KCR DJ, you there's no like Columbia sponsored way for you to play music. Like you need to have someone who's either in a jazz combo like KCR or Wobar. And by Wobar is like by far the, the most lax. So it's kind of like, that's like, as far as throwing a show, being in a band, playing in a band, recording yourself in a band, um, anything like that, like, gotta get your foot in the Wabar door. And so I think, like, Wabar's tech went everywhere. I mean, there were totally bands, but they was, like, funky band. Like, it was, like, Red Hot Chili Peppers type thing. I don't know, like, it was just different. And part of it is the era, but part of it is that there was literally no underground sensibility at all. And I was looking, so this is the, the WBAR first t-shirt, um, and who did we have? We had Roger Manning, who I still love, who was like a subway musician. I don't know why we had him. Soulcraft, which I think maybe was a Columbia band. Changing Bodies, absolutely no idea who that is. Um, John S. Hall, who was the lead singer of a band called King Missile. And then Sex Pod, no idea who that is. And Mud Fudge, which was my friends from St. Louis. Um, and I still, I mean, I'm 99% sure these are all men. It was funny, because when I was there, Vampire Weekend were like, uh, a year and two years older than me and like being in the music scene at Columbia we'd have like battle of the bands I remember they finished like third out of four bands and I was like that's ridiculous this is like a really good band I'm like I can't believe no one here appreciates them my best guess with like 95% certainty is that like Vampire Weekend was like hugely successful completely independent from any association with WBR and as the music on campus there's I'm sure a desire to like associate with that story but like if anything my recollection is like WBR was like not inclined to do any favors to Vampire Weekend and as far as I know never considered booking them for barbecue like they were definitely way too like poppy. The station has also 
really embraced electronic music in a way that it didn't before or at least like from what I saw like when I started out like she had to fight kind of hard or like vouch for Dorian Electra um, which ended up being like iconic <laughs> I mean it's an iconic show it was an iconic show and people now now people hear like oh my god like I can't believe Dorian Electra played at Wobar I mean yeah. I like at, on Barnard's campus for Wobar whatever it's crazy but you know there's there's audio on YouTube of Bikini Kill live at 1020 and it's well it was a Wobar show WBAR must be recognized by SGA in order to secure a broadcast space and apply for funding. I mean, I don't know why we had to go through so many hoops. We've had lots of encouragement from the administration and from students. No one is promising us anything, but the intent is there. <laughs> when physical music was more popular, like Barnard, I'm not sure if cared is the right word, like Barnard appreciated and put more resources into Wabar. Um, and so I'd like to see a return of that. I, I think, you know, Gabby was talking last weekend about like how they used to pay students to stay on campus and run the radio station. And I think that that appreciation um, has been lost a little bit for, you know, the art of physical music. Like not all of the buildings were wired, so Signal didn't actually cover all of campus. And I remember at the time um, talking to Barnard president who was saying, you know, well, everything's going to be streaming, so whatever. But at the time, like, I, it did really feel really far off just because of how bad internet was. <laughs> but I remember feeling, too, like a student within this four-year period of your life, four, maybe five, right? <laughs> that, um, like, it's it kind of sucked to hear that, you know, eventually it'll happen but you but you have you can't tell something will really happen once you know you're out of there but also like why not now yeah people just keep graduating you know like and people just keep like coming and leaving and um and the other thing too is that like the the administration like stays and so they sort of like have this like human relationship with Wilbar where they're kind of like oh like this is like Wilbar treats me like this historically so I will treat them like that but there's like this amnesia in the people that like cycle in and out of Wilbar they're kind of like why is this person like being so stingy with the cash and it's like oh because two years ago this person was like kind of you know nippy in conversation <laughs> and like asked for too much money because you know she assumed that there was going to be like, like that because there was going to be debate or something like that you know like there's that that amnesia is like a challenge and I made a zine about how to use Wilbar's equipment and like distribute it as much as I could before I graduated. The idea was that through zines I could like um, train like the next n amount of people who like came through and they would like you know there would be like tutorials and it's like do this like 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 do this with your hands right now like 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 so that you get the confidence and you like blaze that trail in your brain. I feel like what I like got the most out of Wilbar was that I feel like was by far the institution that I cared about the most, like, within Columbia, and by far the most, like, hurtful thing about graduating was realizing that I had put so much effort into something that honestly ultimately belonged to the institution rather than, like, to us. And so, like, it was really sad to graduate and see, like, how... Because there was so much, like, time investment and, like, emotional investment that I put into Wilbar, sort of being, like... In, in the essence of like, I will never graduate, I'm gonna be here forever. And so like, and I, and I love Wilbar, so I'm just gonna like put a lot of effort into Wilbar. And then graduating and like doing my last show and being like, just like overcome by sadness because I like liked Wilbar so much and I like sort of like imagined it to be like a lot of things. Like, like there were like a lot of things I projected onto Wilbar. I myself was like very comfortable there <laughs> at times and like would always go to it as in moments of like increasingly like went at a loss for something to do. I remember the, I mean, one big moment was um, like 9-11. Where else am I gonna like kind of, who am I gonna be with as I like continue to like take in this like really world changing news, life changing, you know, moment. And I remember being there, people, a couple people were already there. And then throughout the day, more and more people showed up. One of the people, I remember Emily Berger, who'd been a music director and had graduated. And she'd been, I think, around 14th Street when 
everything went down and like half gotten trampled because of um, just people rushing and running and she sprained or broke her arm or something in that rush and you know it's very hard to like go anywhere like to move around or find transportation to leave and she just walked up from 14th street up to WBAR um, and hadn't like you know and, and like also was an alum at the time too and I, th I remember thinking like yeah <laughs> like this is like where we would go Um, yeah, so definitely this. Fuck the Brits is good as well. Um, just on this wall. And do we know how old any of this stuff is? Or it's we just kind of do not. I mean, I feel like, like, since we've been in the studio, people just, like, add as they please. So it's probably, it could be, like, something from 15 years ago is, some, is here along with something from, like, three months ago. Um. Which is kind of beautiful if you think about it. Like I was really interested in the history of it and, you know, started a documentary way back when that I haven't finished. And all of it is sitting in high eight <laughs> tapes somewhere. So if I can find that box, but also find a way to transfer high eight tapes, <laughs> I think is the more crucial detail here, <laughs> then um, we can one day watch them. I have to, I have to listen to it sometime because now that I know that it's, of course it's streaming. Like I, I, for me, it's frozen in time, you know, <laughs> it's, it's in this little box in the nineties, like tucked away somewhere. I, I think it's amazing that, um, that this film is going to exist and that, um, that this history is being told. But I also think there's just, there is something sort of wonderful about walking in as a freshman without knowing all the history and baggage and reinventing it year after year. And then the people who do carry around that knowledge of the four years preceding, they disappear just as quickly. Um, and in, in a way, like, can the real history of the station ever be told? Um, no, no one really knows what came before and what came after them. Um, and I think there's something sort of wonderful about that. There's something really beautiful about that, that the station and the music is a continuum and the students and the DJs just sort of float through it. It's been a long time since we've had a show in the quad here, but this is something that used to happen every year, and we're trying to bring it back. We're trying to build back up the community, and so I appreciate all of your energy. Eat and be merry, and give me a big, wet, sloppy round of applause for Come Girl A. Uh, I actually have a show on Wabar called Fornication. I play girl punk music about sex. Amazing! So, so this is relevant. This is very relevant. <laughs> That's amazing. Do you love it? Yes. This time. I love the basement. It's so much better than doing it like at home. And I think it might be able to be removed. You got that right now? <gasps> Wait. Also, you were amazing. Who are 
at Wabar and they have the most fascinating radio stations. I don't tune in, but they are fascinating and they always seem to have so much fun. And so I know this is a collective of very cool people. With the black